Good luck. Hey everyone, welcome and we're so excited to have you on behalf of ACRO as well as the National Student Clearinghouse. We wanna welcome you in. I'm just gonna give you guys a few seconds to settle your audio and visual preferences and we'll get started. Awesome. Again, on behalf of ACRO, as well as the National Student Clearinghouse, welcome in, guys. We're so excited to have you guys joining us with Dr. Dundar. Um, she's going to be presenting on what does equity mean in data collection and reporting. For those of you guys who haven't joined us before on an ACRO webinar, this is intended to be a bit different than median, so it's less interactive to feature our panelists. But if you guys do want to interact, we strongly encourage using the chat feature as well as the Q&A feature. Um, I believe Dr. Dondar prefers questions to be held until the end, unless your question in, is, ooh, excuse me, extremely pertinent to the slide. Um, on the screen. Again, welcome in, guys, and I'm going to pass the mic to Dr. Afet. Dr. Afet, welcome in, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Afet Dandar. I'm a director at the National Student Crank House Research Center, director for equity in research and analytics. That's my um, official title. And thank you so much for joining this webinar today. I'm here to talk about uh, some of the new line of work for us, equity in um, equity in research and analytics, data equity. And uh, before we get into that, I want to show the overview of the of this webinar or session. I'll say a few things about the National Student Clearinghouse. Although I I think most of you, if not all of you, know about the Clearinghouse. A few things about the Clearinghouse data. Again, a lot of you know about the uh, post-secondary data, but we have a few other data sources that I want to mention as well today. A few words about the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center and the Research Center's focus on data equity. And then uh, we'll talk about really in our context, what equity in data and reporting means to us and how we want to make progress in that area. And um, specifically that uh, how we want to analyze and address equity issues systematically at every step. And that's how we see it, that we should look at the equity issues at every step through uh, data collection or even the funding, uh, data collection, reporting, and use. Um, and uh, this, uh, the full data life cycle really more than it starts uh, in a lot of cases with funding, right? We apply for funding for certain purposes, then we collect the data or um, reporting insights we are producing using in the different platforms and includes that includes also producing visualizations and dissemination of it. Today in today's webinar, I will not so much focus on the communication and dissemination part. And I also want uh, to talk too much about the funding, uh, applying to funding, uh, thinking about what equity means in that stage. I will rather focus on the in data collection, acquisition, in designing the project or research, uh, posing questions, and analysis and interpretation. Very briefly about the clearinghouse. Uh, Clearinghouse was established about almost 30 years ago now, and the mission of the organization is to serve the education and workforce communities. That's two pieces are very important to us, education and workforce communities, and all learners um, with access to trusted data, with uh, to services and insights and metrics. And we use uh, learners, not students, because we have later in the presentation, I'll men mention that um, some of our data submitters actually are not uh, from colleges and universities. So we, we want to encompass this, uh, we, we say all learners. And FERPA compliant, I put it there because we do have a lot of data, but we do not share individual level data, of course, with um, anyone else other than the data providers. But in subsequent uh, slides, I will 
uh, I will mention a few things, how we use the data. Of course, we do use the data to produce aggregate results. And I'll say more about it on the um, on further slides. About the clearinghouse data, you most of you are familiar with the enrollment reporting because uh, colleges and universities, this is our largest data, uh, data set enrollments from colleges and universities. This uh, the first line shows what um, data elements we are collecting there. Um, data coverage at this point is 97% for public institutions, 99.5%, um, a little lower at private nonprofits for year and private for-profits at around 82%. And the data comes from all types of institutions. And in each of the 50 states, the coverage is very high at 90, over 90%. Institutions participate in enrollment reporting voluntarily and they can share at no cost. Um, some services have a small fee, sometimes no cost or low cost uh, to, uh, to track your own students. Institutions can also get the services from us uh, when they submit data. Degree Verify, you're familiar with that too. These are detailed information about degrees. Uh, the coverage is 95% at this point. Post-secondary data partnerships, some of you may be familiar. This is a somewhat new service. This um, we established in uh, 2017, about five years now. At this point, over 500 colleges and universities participate in that. Uh, within PDP, institutions submit a lot more nuanced data to us, course credit grade data, and um, they get back a lot of really good, um, good metrics, some uh, uh, conventional metrics like persistent retention and completion, but also metrics that use these course credit grade data um, through Tableau visualizations and through other um, analysis ready file. Industry credentials, this might be new to um, most of you, perhaps NSC, uh, the current house has a service where we are collecting data uh, from industry credential providers. For the, um, at this point, we have six, I believe seven actually is just about joining. Uh, for the most part, these are manufacturing credentials. We believe we have about, um, it's difficult to have a coverage on industry credentials, but we have about, uh, one third of manufacturing credentials at this point. We also have safety professionals data and um, at least one industry credential provider from a healthcare. Um, high school diploma data, we, we also receive this data from high schools, high school uh, with a graduation date um, from high schools, high, uh, school districts, and sometimes states uh, can submit the data. Of course, they get back for post-secondary enrollment and degree data for, for those students. And at this point, about half of all US high school graduates are in, in our data. And it has a point, it, this might be a little refresher, it just has a, a point before I move to that equity piece um, to refresh our memory, what data we are collecting and um, data submission very briefly again, for the first uh, bullet point, probably you are familiar with that. Enrollment reporting comes very frequently, multiple times per term. Degree Verify, we are recommending to submit it um, within 30 days of awarding degrees or certificates. Um, PDP comes from the Institutional Research Office at least twice a year. They can submit really any time, more than twice, but this is our at least twice a year. That's what we recommend. Industry credentials, at least once a year. That's what we recommend to industry credential providers. The first time they join, they submit historical data on industry credentials. Uh, some of them choose to submit maybe the previous six years, 10 years. Some of them submitted more than that, back to really 20 years or more of the, whatever they, they awarded over those years. And high school diploma data, usually we recommend at least once when the majority of the gradu graduations happen in summer, but they can uh, submit more, more, uh, more than that, more frequently than that. Um, how we use the data, I said for the compliance, which means we really, uh, I'm focusing on here more how we use the data to produce aggregate results. And of course, uh, data submitters also receive data from us. Um, researchers can follow uh, the students, learners across all types of institutions. As I mentioned, it's not limited by state lines. Um, we, uh, we measure outcomes over multiple years for different cohorts. And race ethnicity data is available more, um, more complete 
since 2016. Although we have race ethnicity data before that, it's, a, it, it, it's an optional data element, but uh, we have been able to produce our reports with race ethnicity data for, for recent years. Program level data is also available for all the aggregate results <clears throat> um, since 2015 and course credit grade data available through post secondary data partnership. The service started in 2017, but the data went back to 10, uh, 2010, 11. So that's the oldest year, the earliest year that we have in, in PDP. The research center um, uh, was established in 2010. I actually, that's the year when I started at the clearinghouse at the research center. Uh, we used it, that this was vision of our CEO, Rick Torres, you, you probably know him, to, um, to really use the data to benefit our both data providers and um, the policymakers and really education community. Uh, so we use the data to produce outcomes for colleges, high schools, states, um, again, as I said earlier, education community, we produce reports, benchmarking um, for institutions or policymakers. And finally, uh, recently, a few months ago, uh, we, we established a new initiative that we called Equity in Data Research and Analytics. And um, although we, the conversations uh, was before that, the formal establishment was just then late fall. Uh, but before that, of course, for a year, we discussed really how, uh, what it means for us as an organization that holds this much data. And this is something that we do need to, to, to keep in mind. And uh, from here onward, where I will focus on that uh, data equity initiative and some of details, what we plan to do and how we would like really uh, to move forward as we are moving forward to hopefully work with our institutions, data submitters, especially data submitters as well, and the organizations that who receive from our uh, data from us. The objectives of this unit, I, I, I call it a unit, this is a part of the research center, this, uh, this work, uh, but it is for the entire clearinghouse, of course. We want to investigate, establish, and drive forward the principles for an equitable and unbiased approach to data collection, data collection and reporting and analytics at the clearinghouse. And we'll kind of unpack on what, what, um, what it means for us. Uh, really develop and grow the learning agenda for data and analytics to better reflect equity. And finally, we are hoping that as we are establishing these principles and practices through these best practice, investigating best practices, and we will develop capacity internally uh, that we can help also, again, our organizations that work with us, institutions that submit data to us, which we hope ultimately would lead to establishment of center of excellence at the clearinghouse for equity in data and analytics. And with center of excellence, we really mean it's not a, a formal unit with you hired people, but rather the expertise across the organization. Um, why equity in data and reporting? I want to provide context, context specifically for uh, how we were working with data and how we made that, how that evolved since 2010. That's the year when the Clearinghouse Research Center was established, and we were tasked to, with using the data to produce these insights and metrics, right? And at this point, over the, the first five years, we really wanted to showcase the strengths of the data. And we perceived that data, and uh, many people perhaps so far still say that, you know, in general, data are perceived to, to be a good thing for everyone to enable this enables objective research. And we specifically focus those years on longitudinal data, national trends. As we progress through years 2016, 19, and this is not really clear uh, year ranges, and it doesn't mean one ended in 2015 and the other started in 2016, but rather the evolution. Of, of course, they continued over these years. Um, since 2016, we saw really national trends are not enough. There are specific interest in the looking at the national level, but looking specifically on uh, outcomes to data for student, different student populations. Right, and we also switched from not so much switched, but added um, in addition to long-term metrics that we uh, we produced. These are completion rate, transfer, 
uh, we focused also on what we called near-term metrics. These are uh, PDP data, post-secondary data, partnership, course credit, grade data, allowed these near-term metrics. And long-term metrics such as completion, uh, they are good for policymakers, right? Institutional policymakers, state or uh, national, when they look at the cohort and say, okay, this cohort had 50 something percent completion, but it is too late for those students themselves because they left. This is historical cohort. So we look at those long-term metrics or as for policymakers, but near-term metrics such as credit accumulation rate, credit completion ratio, those are more for practitioners because we're hoping that uh, practitioners can use those metrics to help students uh, while they are enrolled. They haven't left the institution. So. Um, some other terms used for this are leading indicators for near-term metrics and lagging indicators for long-term metrics. And then we, um, in 2020, 2021, as many organizations, we, we thought about the intentionality and efforts, what we need to do uh, really to help students while they are involved. Again, the continuation of near-term metrics. And I know that many organizations uh, and our colleges and universities really focused on um, not to have initiatives just for the sake of initiative, but rather how we can have intentional efforts to help students and taking equity-minded actions. And I know that uh, and so far still, we are focusing on equitable outcomes, looking at the uh, outcomes. But we also thought about um, that before we produce those reports, what does equity mean in the data collection when we are collecting, when we're looking at the data? So we thought that we should actually go um, a little bit step back, start from earlier stages, not just looking at the outcomes level, but uh, equity in data. Because earlier I mentioned that even though perhaps conventionally we think that data are um, objective, once we use the data, quantitative data, we'll get objective results. But data involves, working with data involves making many, many decisions. And <clears throat> those decisions have equity implications. And without the explicit attention to those decisions, uh, how, what decisions we are making in data collection uh, or, or reporting or producing outcomes, they, uh, without those, that explicit attention, it may have harmful consequences for individuals and communities. Um, inadequate data use or misuse of data may contribute to creating power imbalances, leading to further inequitable outcomes for some groups. And I do want specifically to mention that here, when I say misuse of data or inadequate data use, I don't focus on uh, technical side of it. I'm not talking about uh, privacy and security. Of course, uh, Clearinghouse has well-established reputation in those things, and it is very important to us, and it should be important to everybody, of course, who, um, who collects and maintains data. But it is more than that. It's not uh, privacy and security. It's, it's not only privacy and security, but also in what ways we are using the data. Um, and specifically, for example, the data algorithms, right? Are we using algorithms to make decisions? And are we aware of the positive or negative consequences of those decisions, ultimately in practical terms when we apply those algorithms in practice? And I'll have a few examples as we move through the, the, the slides. Um, and, um, and it's not only about, I mentioned earlier in the overview, this is about um, looking at that equity in, in at every stage, right? At every step before we even use that data for anything in the data uh, collection or acquisition stage. Um, and, uh, and for us, this part is very important in education, especially, and in workforce data as well, probably. This conversation has been going on in many areas, in, in many industries. I think in healthcare, it's very important now what data is collected, for whom that data is, uh, outcomes are, are valid, uh, right? Are they valid in, in healthcare or in medical research? Are the results valid for, for all, all um, 
certain minority groups or we need to have more data for them, how, how we are producing the data, are they valid for everybody when we are uh, talking about the results of certain scientific findings and et cetera. Um, for us, uh, equity in data collection, of course, we are collecting a lot of data, but we're also acquiring data. Uh, we are using, uh, sometimes uh, we have conversations with College Board, or we have a lot of efforts now to work with different organizations to bring workforce employment data um, to, to, do, uh, to, to, to look at it versus education and employment data. So in that sense, acquisition is also um, relevant here. We want to make sure that data are empowering, actionable, and accessible accessible to those who might benefit from that. Usually uh, those marginalized groups perhaps who, who haven't had historically or conventionally access to that. But also empowering, right? Not about um, uh, these deficit narratives, but rather in empowering and actionable to improve, improve things. Intended capabilities and potential limitations are clearly stated. Um, and this is also important to, for us to analyze because uh, sometimes the the averages that we are uh, 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 we may be reporting they may not be valid for everybody. And are we able to have the granular results? This is about intended capabilities and potential limitations. Being transparent about potential limitations of the of the data. Who is creating the system? Risks and potential harms. We all, of course, think that we do not do things that will intentionally harm our learners, but the algorithm that we are developing, this is more about being intentional, not that we are actually, in, um, not that we, I'm suggesting or implying that anybody is doing potentially harmful things. And this is important piece for us also, data do not contribute to automating. You may have heard it elsewhere, um, these algorithms automating patterns of injustice or bias. Um, sometimes it might be bias. I'll give you one example. For example, actually at the clearing house, we have um, gender, uh, we, we call it gender data, and it comes from the institutions, but it's an optional data element. A lot of times institutions do not submit it. And we had actually imputation strategy where we could uh, impute uh, gender as male or female. But that, and we get a lot of questions about it when we are going to expand the values of that data element. But the algorithm we have in place, we of course don't uh, intend to harm anybody, but we automated that pattern, right? Like as long as we use that algorithm, we're not going to get any more than those two values until we, um, we open it up to institutions and institutions, some of them are collecting, some don't, uh, other values for gender identity. Um, so yeah, that's that's one example. It's not um, it, that's how we can create algorithms that can keep the bias going actually in the data, and it's also automating patterns of injustice, uh, predictive analytics. Everything can be used for good reasons or for not good reasons, right? Predictive analytics can, if we are um, early warning systems, for example, if we have early warning systems that support students, that's good. If they are used for predicting that somebody is not going to be successful, and that's why upfront early on should be excluded from certain things, or uh, they should be encouraged to unenroll or something, that's, that's where algorithms can contribute to automating patterns, patterns of injustice. Systems can constantly evolve. Uh, we are, for example, at the Kring House, we are talking about migration to the cloud. We are actually doing that. And a lot of you, you, you change your systems. So it's not one time thing we, to do it and be done with it, right? As the systems evolve, we want to have the continuous and reasonable transparency. We don't wanna, of course, have really um, so, much, uh, uh, so much effort. We don't wanna put too much effort burden to change the system, so to look at the system so frequently, but as the systems evolve, it's important to be also have reasonable transparency in place to, uh, to, to be clear what data we are collecting, how we are acquiring it, and how uh, we are using that data. And one of the Big, uh, what we consider one of the uh, good efforts and big efforts for us, for example, in that um, 
equity in data phase is about, uh, is about bias assessment. Um, and bias assessment to be aware of the biases in the data we collected or acquired and either reduce those biases or to be transparent about it, right? If we are unable, sometimes it would be perhaps not possible if it's historical data that was collected to, to correct that data historically, but to be transparent that this is how data was collected. And the bias assessment, this is not limited to what I have on this slide, but bias assessment is about identifying sources and locations of the potential biases in the data, which means um, depending on the original purpose, how data was collected, uh, there might be that there are groups of people who were intentionally not included or groups of people accidentally not included. The firm format of the questions, how the data submission was, how we collected race ethnicity. I mentioned gender earlier. That's how um, it started many years ago. And if we don't change it, it will continue. Um, the format, as I said, format of the questions, where was the data collected? Tools, technology used to collect data and what parts of the data comes from administrative databases. So the purpose of the data and whether that purpose limited the data collection and how it reflects itself in the things, in the outcomes or uh, metrics that we want to produce now. Uh, and I wanna say something about these tools and technology. Uh, I, I hope that a lot of people explicitly think about it. A lot of organizations, uh, colleges and universities use vendors. They use vendors to submit data to the clearinghouse, right? And they might be using vendors for different purposes, early warning systems or some other, um, uh, the, some other uh, insights platform or whatever you, you, you need at your institution. And that vendor assessment is part of our also analyzing the bias assessment, how technologies we are using or vendor technologies we are using might be limiting or introducing bias to the data we are collecting. And I'll give you um, one example, for example, uh, sometimes we hear from colleges and universities, they say, you know, the vendor we are using for race ethnicity, they're saying we can have only five values. We cannot have more than five, right? And then uh, you have to co combine many groups of students into some other category. So then we're not able to produce outcomes, for example, um, certain, populations of students. That's, we kind of think it's not even um, just, you know, it's out of control, out of control of the institution or the clearinghouse, it's some technology, but that's uh, where the importance comes that we, to the extent possible, perhaps we should do vendor assessment. We should uh, not allow the technology to limit our ability to, um, uh, to, 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 to collect good data or not to introduce that bias into data collection at such an early early stage that we're not able actually to do meaningful meaningful outcomes later. Moving on uh, into um, and of course bias assessment is a really big area. This is uh, as I mentioned, we ourselves just started. We're going through that. Uh, for all um, for all the data we are collecting, and uh, perhaps it's not one time effort, right? It's still it's it's just developing that capacity to be able to continue doing that. Once we have the data, we do have a lot of data already, historical data. How we look at the equity issues in <clears throat> project or research design? How we are posing questions? Um, it is. <clears throat> it's also it's important to us because. Uh, as I said, we started uh, with uh, producing longitudinal data. We, we thought it is important and we still think it's important um, without really focus on this, um, the equity part of the project or research. And uh, that's how we want to move now, how we want to think about the equity goals of every project or research, uh, research we are doing. Whose perspectives? Again, this uh, idea that uh, once we are using quantitative data, we don't need to think about perspective. There's no perspective, right? It's objective research that we are doing with data. But whose perspectives does this project research center on? And where do we place the burden to change? And this is specifically is going to be important for uh, colleges and universities, really those 
who directly work with the students, right? That's what I mean when I say, um, uh, perhaps this is also um, important for high schools and really uh, any organization or entity that works directly with the students. Once we have the results, and I'll say more about what I mean by where do we place that burden to, to change? Um, because once we have the results, right? What should happen next? In the analysis, of course, we are leveraging the power of data to improve our understanding of a certain issue. But the important thing is when we think about the equity goal of the project or research, it's yes, we want to apply numbers to uh, assess and address disparities. But it is also about um, actively questioning those default, default methods and assumptions. Um, examining data on structural conditions and social and historical context. And I, I'll give you one example. Of course, um, I, I mentioned earlier that starting 2016, we, are, we have been producing breakdowns by race ethnicity. And many of you probably have it in your reporting, right? And, and that's good, that's, that's where we should start, right? Uh, we look at the, without looking at the breakdown, we wouldn't know what's uh, happening. But that's not enough because um, and we are realizing that, right? But for how many years our completion report, our transfer report, persistent retention, all of them have breakdown by race ethnicity. And we over and over every year, we say um, this group of students have lower completion rate or low transfer rate. But this uh, questioning default uh, methods and assumptions or looking at other things is about when we say, for example, um, completion rate is low for uh, uh, this group of students, for black students or for Hispanic students. Uh, what do we mean by that? What does uh, the race there stands for something else, right? It's a proxy for something else, but we are not doing it. We're not, uh, until we try to find that, what is it proxy for? What are the things that are at play there? So we can give the breakdown, but it is, it's, uh, does it change any results? Does it change any outcomes? So this is about uh, looking at structural conditions, social historical context, and really questioning me methods and assumptions and data we are using in terms of what other data we need to find out what race stands for there. What is it proxy for? That's the question to answer. Right? And then that would require perhaps collecting either qualitative data or data on structural conditions or other things that you think that you, you, you are seeing that it might be at play to explain. And the interpretations, again, uh, we tend at the uh, Current House Research Center, we say, you know, we, we, we have data, we, we put out the numbers and, and we will continue doing that, right? It's, uh, we are hoping that other organizations that use our data to really can uh, uh, look at this, what, how to interpret this data, what meanings we can take from these numbers and what implications of the interpretations from what perspective those implications are. are, are. And I, I put here equity choice one and two and three, and I specifically wanna focus on number three, which I mentioned earlier. So this is about really for uh, what, how do, do the results look like? Are they good or bad or for whom good or bad? And by whose standards, right? By whose standards they are good or bad? And so what, what who should change? Um, and I, I, yes, we all understand and accept that individuals have agency, they, they can do things to change, but it is about uh, not putting burden back to on individuals that they should work harder, they should improve their results. It's really looking at more than that, right? What is at play there? As I mentioned on the earlier slide and the analysis, um, what else, what else do we need to look at and what else needs to change to, to improve those results. So these are, our, uh, these are the, some of the things that uh, we have been working on and we, we, we are very open to work with the institutions and organizations that uh, some of them have done some work on that, but it is very, um, as I mentioned earlier, this equity in data 
it's uh, perhaps there are more conversations in algorithmic machine machine learning and on algorithmic bias in machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, facial recognition in healthcare, in financial sector, perhaps you know how the data can be used to um, for uh, for credits uh, uh, as an assessment. Um, but relatively new in uh, uh, workforce and education, we are hoping that really we can make good progress uh, first in terms of what the data we are collecting and holding and working with, but also really sharing and uh, creating this community for, with our data, data providers. And before, I want to say a few things about the selected sources. Uh, specifically, I want to mention the last uh, part, otherwise, you know, without uh, first explanation, it may not be clear what it is. Um, there's a, a framework, our uh, education to workforce indicator framework. One of the components of it is data equity principles. I was part of the advisory board for those data equity principles. Uh, these are, uh, Mathematica is the organization. It's, an, it's a big initiative. There are other components there. Um, and it is going to be released in summer 2020. I wanted to make sure I, I clarify what it is. And those data equity principles really talk about these things, uh, what that equity means in every stage, how we, how we should work with the data. There are many examples. They are not, of course, you will have your own examples there <clears throat> as, you, as you will see those principles. Because they haven't been released yet, I, I couldn't... Um, specifically talk about each of those principles, but I wanted to mention it, um, that it will, be, it, it will be coming soon. And I'm part of that advisory board there. <clears throat> uh, with that, other, uh, other sources are uh, on the website, you know, Algorithmic Justice League, that focuses a lot on, um, on um, algorithmic bias in machine learning and artificial intelligence, and data equity framework is really um, covers a lot of areas. Um, questions, or if you also have, you know, we can go through hopefully some of the questions you may have, uh, but also please my email here, uh, dandar at studentclearinghouse.org. If you have any other thoughts or feedback, we are going to make intentional efforts also to, to work with the institutions um, uh, to hear their best practices or um, uh, so if you have any thoughts or feedback or you wanna be engaged, please let me know. <clears throat> um, yes, and I, I hope we can work together as we move forward. But with that, that concludes my presentation part of the webinar. I, I hope you have some questions or some feedback or some thoughts that you can contribute to this conversation. Dr. Fed, thank you so much for your presentation. This was so informative. Um, I do encourage everybody who is listening right now to participate, whether it's in the chat or again, using that Q&A function on the very bottom of your screen. We definitely encourage questions. And if you prefer your questions to be private, her email is available right on the screen for you guys. But we'll give a couple of minutes for you guys to think about questions, reflect a little bit, and then add to the conversation. So I'm seeing a, a chat in our conversation from Stacy. Stacy, thank you so much for your question. She's asking, can you provide some further examples of where there were equity issues in data collection? So, um, you know, we we ourselves in in specifically in our data, <clears throat> I I mentioned one earlier that you know uh, whether we have uh, the values that we need to provide data. We, we get um, this feedback from relevant associations, organizations that Native American students or uh, somewhat smaller groups of students that we, we, we put together as other, they don't want that. They want their own results. And if we're not able to collect it, if we uh, collect it as other, then we're not able to, to, to produce outcomes. 
that's the, um, or I mentioned, you know, how we impute data. And I know that some, <clears throat> there are examples, for example, when, when the institutions went to with test optional, when they don't have test scores, they, uh, they, in, they try to impute certain, uh, certain uh, background metrics to, to come up with some decisions, right? Those are type of things that uh, either the data are missing or we are imputing certain things to arrive into decisions. And that's, the, um, that's how we, uh, algorithmic bias can be introduced in our decision making. And I actually have a question to continue the conversation as well, because I know that this information that you guys are providing based on research is really, really beneficial to our main, um, our main community at ACRO with registrars and admissions officers. But I'm wondering, are there other departments within universities and institutions that you guys connect with where this data can be applicable? And how do you guys um, launch that communication and maintain it to ensure that, for example, diversity and inclusion departments are seeing what you guys are finding. Oh, I thought I'm not sure if you are on mute or not. That question was for you, my friend. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, because you said God. I okay. Um, I, I said this we are opening up for the institutions as well. I think it is really yes, a lot of <clears throat> it's the institutional research office, it's the different committees, you know, institutions have retention committee or transfer advisory council, all, um, all these um, task forces that are using data, really it's not limited to registrars, yes, perhaps uh, registrars, some of the data, transactional data uh, comes from the registrars. Uh, the data collection piece, some of the data collection happening there, but it is also about the reporting and uses that can be across many uh, tax forces or committees that uh, exist or offices, you know, financial aid office that exists at uh, colleges and universities. Um, I saw, a, I believe, a question about what is the, <clears throat> I, I, I wasn't implying a specific concern about administrative databases, but it is, it's about it had some specific purpose, right? And that purpose might have been dictated what was collected, how it was collected, just to be aware of that, what is missing, that there might have been a reason for that, who was excluded, the questions that I was, and again, I wasn't necessarily implying that that is the case, but rather um, asking those questions explicitly, who was excluded, who was included, intentionally or unintentionally excluded. Those were the things that I was, I. I and it looks like we have another question coming in from Reginald. Will Clearinghouse be expanding its definitions in terms um, of gender for tracking purposes? So I imagine beyond the he and her, but also they, them, and so on and so forth. It's a great question. Yes, absolutely, and um, we are looking at it. Yes, uh, in 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 enrollment reporting that we have, um, I, we we get these questions. We haven't changed it yet, but yes, it is. It's something we are working on. We uh, we did change actually in PDP post secondary data partnership. Where we just released the new data submission guidelines that expanded those values. Um, but PDP has about 500 institutions, so it's not our main enrollment reporting database. Um, I see, and as a question, how do you recommend people proceed? Uh, you know, as we work on this, you know, we will. Uh, when we have all the, uh, we are very clear about data equity principles. That's where we, we think about the purpose of the data. We have meaningful data, enough data to say, to say things that will benefit those individuals. Um, th there is um, a really strong suggestion to involve people whose data we are collecting 
in that decision making process, how we are collecting, what they are comfortable with. And I know that at a at a very big level, sometimes it's not possible. For example, a clinic is not collecting data directly from individuals. That's not um, that's not the case for us. But if you're collecting directly from the individuals, yes, really uh, uh, treating individuals as data experts. That's also another um, uh, another movement or another suggestion that uh, out there uh, to involve the individuals in that process. And 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 really being uh, again analyzing what decisions we're making in algorithms. It's our gender imputation was okay for us a few years ago. Right, we were not even thinking about it. So sometimes it might come um, a little later, uh, but ideally it would happen prior, prior to collection, prior to analysis. And Dr. Afet, what are some ways that institutions, such as um, those watching us and joining us on our webinar, can participate in this research beyond just accessing it? Are there ways that they can contribute to the research that's ongoing right now with the National Clearinghouse? Um, yes, yes. And we are going to think about even more, uh, more ways to involve institutions. One way we are thinking, you know, some of our uh, services like PDP, post-secondary data partnership and student tracker has advisory board that institutions participate. One way for us, you know, that's what we are planning to do it through those advisory boards. Um, we have an equity hub, which the work just started at the clearinghouse. We want to create a community through that equity hub, actually. So that's how and as a way we want to involve institutions, that community that institutions can contribute with their suggestions, or they can see how what we are doing, how they can contribute and share. I didn't realize I was muted. Absolutely, that's that's definitely great. Thank you. So we are going to leave the floor open for questions until around two fifty-five. I know sometimes people have questions and they're hesitant to ask, but really this is a very open space. So if you guys do have questions, again, please feel free to participate, drop a question in our Q&A or participate in the chat, or you can email Dr. Afet directly, but we'll go ahead and leave the space open. It's funny, I was talking to Dr. Afet right before we started the webinar and I was like, we should have music for the, for the wait times. Um, but I am seeing another question coming in from um, Josie. She says, how can people build good quality, qualitative surveys meant to reach diverse audiences? That's a great question. Yes, and, and you know, the clearinghouse works only with quantitative data. Yes, I might be, you know, um, I don't want to pretend to be an expert in uh, collecting qualitative data, but it is um, hopefully as we have more research and guidance, especially those data equity principles when they are out there, uh, really thinking about the questions that will give you additional insight, right? It's not only about things that there are things that you have in quantitative, but based on your context, what questions will get you more, will get you closer to understanding what is going on, why, is, uh, why this student population, this group has um, not great outcomes in certain metrics. Really de designing those questions around that. And it perhaps if you, if it is possible, um, if it is, at all possible to involve some individuals in the design of the questions. Really, that's the, especially with qualitative studies, usually qualitative studies, the sample is not millions, of course, that might be actually possible to involve um, individuals as data experts, which we don't usually think, right? We think that experts are uh, people with the background, but uh, educational training and background, but those individuals whose data we are collecting might be really useful then. Um, yes, that um, the, the race, it, it was really amazing to me too. I think I, 
uh, when I realized that when we discussed it in different meetings that uh, we, we give this breakdown, we, we say black students have this, Hispanic students have that, it has nothing to do that race is a proxy for something else there. And because we don't have enough data to get to that, we just limit ourselves to that breakdown. Uh, so breakdown is good, but it's not enough. Um, hopefully over time, there might be either literature or common practices, common data elements that will come up that those things are explaining these differences and then we can collect those data. Of course, if it comes, if there are certain data that will give us those answers, at least partially, Clearing House would be also open to collecting those data at the national level from institutions, right? It's going to be really a very a community effort to get to those. And sometimes it might be context specific um, that, uh, what are the things behind that? What are the what are the things that behind those results um, that we have by race ethnicity? The breakdown that we see. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's of course not a, a set of five variables that we know, right? It's that's the difficulty of it. We don't know. Um, maybe we know anecdotally, but it is about really. Co uh, co it it goes back really again to the system conditions and um, social historical context. Um, the, the, the issue here is that I want to add actually something that right now, when we want to explain things, we use other data elements that might be equally biased, right? We look at the completion, we say completion rate is low. Let's look at GPA. GPA will explain that. Let's look at grade, but uh, GPA might might be biased itself. There is historical context, right? Who has good GPA or not? There are other system conditions. So it is about really going beyond, that's what I meant that um, conventional methods or data elements. It's what are the things that, other things that explain this difference, not, not just GPA. And Josie had a really good question as well. Alan, thanks again for your question. Josie's asking, what are some common mistakes or assumptions people make when they are interpreting quantitative data in terms of equity? Oh, it's that it's it's really um, just you throw it there, you you run the analysis, and that's very objective. There are no decisions. The decisions may not uh, wouldn't be biased per se. Or uh, and, and the other common, uh, this is more on the outcome side where we, when we give the averages, um, uh, sometimes we, we, we see this saying, oh, this salary, if you have this program of study, you will have uh, a job that will pay this salary, but salary may not be actually true for everybody. That's uh, the just general average at national level may not be applicable to be, to be transparent about that. And to say that, you know, this is, um, this may not be everybody's case, this average salary. So that's the assumption, really, not to rely on averages really too much. Mm -hmm. And I want to actually build off of uh, Josie's earlier question when she was talking about building quality quantitative and qualitative surveys. Um, because so often, I think that the research you guys are doing are bit of fitting um, communities that are hardest to reach and hardest to engage with, right? So what are... Um, Apart from, I know that you said that listening, obviously, and kind of working with communities to build these surveys is a tactic, but what are other tactics you're using um, with the NSC to really reach those communities who, for whatever reason, might put up um, borders between wanting to even contribute to the research in the first place? Uh, that would be a really great question for our institutions. I mentioned earlier that Clearinghouse actually doesn't collect directly from individuals' data. So we work with the institution. So we don't, we don't reach out to individuals, but that would be something uh, for our institutions and data providers to, uh, to, to be thinking about and to get to involve those uh, communities.
And just for those who will be watching the recording later on, I also want to mention Alan's Cole's question that just came in. I often hear the declaration that some group of students is disproportionately represented for something because of some numbers diff because, excuse me, some numbers differ, usually around race. How should that be measured or compared um, by racial composition of the campus, the region, the nation? That's that's a great question. There is no standard for that, but that would be, we are actually working on a project um, looking at the success rate of certain populations of students. And the, we are thinking about how, what, it, what should be the benchmark, right? And I should, um, it could be the state, it could be your region. Um, when we look at the labor market outcomes, for example, they look at the region, like the salaries might be different. So national average may not be, applicable there. It is very context specific or the disproportional, the question was about disproportionate representation. Really it's the context specific. It's like whether you want to take the state or region um, to look at certain, certain breakdowns. But being transparent, right? That's the equity implication of the decision you are making. Uh, not to consider that it was just objective decision, but rather there were certain things that you used to arrive that decision and to be transparent about that sort of process. All right, and Josie and Alan, again, thank you so much for your questions and for everybody that's attended, again, on behalf of ACRO, as well as the National Clearinghouse. Thank you guys so much for taking time out of your day to join us and to have this important conversation. Dr. Afet, thank you so, so much for being with us. If you guys have any further questions, now is the time to ask. I'm gonna give it about 60 seconds. And if not, if anything, I will give you guys back four minutes in your afternoon. Again, Dr. Afet, thank you so, so much for your time and for taking taking the time to join us and presenting. We'll give it 60 seconds, and if not, we'll go ahead and close out for the afternoon. Alrighty, everybody have a fantastic afternoon and thank you so much again. And we will see you next webinar. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Bye bye.